actually really like working with Elizabeth May. And the reason for that is because our brains are so different. If you show Elizabeth a series of dots, she'll join them together. If you show me, you show me a series of dots, I'll look at the first one. And I'll say, what does this mean? Basically, tonight, we we're going to be talking about uh, some legislation. And I think that uh, I don't get past the minutiae in, in, in little sections of this act, whereas I think that uh, um, Elizabeth sees the big picture. Uh, if you like, I see the tree, she sees the, uh, the forest, but we both see whole growth. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm going to start by begging your indulgence. I want to talk about more than Bill C-51. I want to talk about another bill that is going through Parliament at the moment, uh, called Bill C-44. And I can easily explain why I want to talk about it both as a package. The day before Bill C-51 came in the front door of Parliament, Bill C-44 went out the back door of the House of Commons into the Senate. Bill C-51 is called what is it? The Anti-Terrorism Act of 2015. The uh, Bill C-44 is called the Protection of Canada Against Terrorism Act. I think they're the same package. I think they're, they go together as the same thing when you fit them together. What does Bill C-44 do, the one that's now in the Senate? I think it's that you vote to get it. Yeah. Oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> you never know with these Green Party. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But the entire caucus voted against it. Okay, so what does, uh, what, what does Bill C-44 say? It says three things. The first thing that it says is that sources that are used by CSIS now have an absolute privilege that their identity will never be disclosed. That's very, very, very clear on that. The second thing that it does is it takes the citizenship legislation that was enacted in June and it brings it immediately into force. And the citizenship legislation that was enacted in June allows for the first time revocation of citizenship for criminal acts and anti-terrorism. The third thing that it does is it gives uh, judges the ability to issue warrants to allow CSIS to operate outside of Canada. So those are the three things that aren't part of Bill C-51. Now, we are being led to believe that C-51 is a package that is designed to deal with measures that we have recent measures that we have become very, very familiar with because the media is giving them a great deal of promise. So let me just give you a couple of things that the, that the government is saying uh, Bill C-51 is about. And guess what? I have it here. I'm just telling Terry, I actually have not read the whole thing. I just can't. It's uh, impossible to do this with my little detailed brain. I get, I get stuck. And so I look at the bits that I know I'll understand. But if you go to the beginning of this bill, uh, you will see something that sounds familiar. The second part tells us that it enacts the Secure Air Travel Act. Secure Air Travel Act in order to provide a new legislative framework for identifying and responding to persons who may engage in an act that poses a threat to transportation security or who may travel by air for the purpose of committing a terrorism offense. Who are we thinking about here? Government leads us into this trap of saying, this is an act that's dealing with all these kids who are going across overseas to fight for ISIS. But that's, who, that that's what the act is about, right? That it's about a particular group of people who are very worried about it. And we hear about 15 and 16 year olds who are leaving home and are, and are flying overseas to get in something that they, uh, that they don't know. Of course that is worrying. But we're being told that this act of speed is the way to deal with that. If you look at another, another part of the introduction, you see it, it says, it also provides a judge with the power to order the seizure of terrorist propaganda, or if the propaganda is in electronic form, in order 
uh, to order the deletion of the propaganda from computer systems. So what's this, what's this about? Well, once again, we've heard all about this recently, haven't we, about the radicalization from people who are using the computers to get these kids to leave the country and go to school. So that's what, the, the, that's what this act is really about. That's what they're, they're leading us to believe. We've seen it in the paper that prominence our mind. They're trying to tell us that that's what the, the legislation is aimed to deal with. Secondly, I think that they, they want to make it very clear that there's a housekeeping exercise going on that things don't work too efficiently in government, they never have, they never will, but it's always good to be able to, uh, to, to uh, uh, make, make things work better. So in terms of the, the Immigration and Refugee uh, Protection Amendment, we're told that the aim is to define obligations related to the provision of information in proceedings under the Immigration what a fabulous thing to do, to define obligations. Why didn't we think of that before? That's a wonderful, uh, a wonderful bill. You read this and you think this is going to be great. Well, what I'm going to suggest to you is that this bill is not about these things. It's about something that is not recent. It's about something that's been going on for a long time. That the aim of the government is not to deal with reason late 2014 events in Canada. So what the government is trying to do is respond to something. But what they're responding to is judicial decisions that have created major setbacks to their agenda. If you want to put it simply and bluntly, in Parliament we really don't have any opposition anymore that can stop the government. Outside of Parliament we have an opposition and the leader of that opposition is Beverly McLaughlin, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada, who the, the, the government goes out of their way to try and meet. What Beverly McLaughlin has said to this government is, if you want something as law, well, you have to bring it before our court, you have to actually give reasons for bringing it into law, you have to defend these reasons in this public forum, something that doesn't happen in Parliament anymore. And we will tell you, we will ask you questions, we'll ask your lawyers questions about what you are trying to do. If you cannot defend it satisfactorily, we will hold that it's not legal. We have an arena, a forum of public debate because it doesn't exist in Parliament. So, let me try and defend this view that what we have is a government pushing back on the judiciary by telling you the story of what the government is actually responding to in this act. And there's really four cases that I want to refer to. I want to refer to them quite quickly. First of all, I refer to this idea that thesis sources should remain anonymous. Well, in 2014, uh, Mohammed Harkat challenged our security certificate regime. He took it to the Supreme Court of Canada, and he lost. But the government also lost in that case. And the government lost because they made a pitch to the Supreme Court. We need you to recognize absolute privilege and anonymity for our sources. And the court said, that's not a good idea. And they offered reasons why it isn't a good idea, and I think you can think of some of them. And so what we have, a few months later, is the government saying to the court, well, we think you're wrong. We think this is a great idea. So there's number one. It's a direct response to a judicial decision. Number two, I want to go a little bit further back. Omer Chatter. In the Omer Chatter decision that went to the Supreme Court of Canada, the Prime Minister against Chatter, Chatter made this argument that even although he has walked away in Guantanamo, when thesis officers come down to interrogate him, they have to abide by the Charter of Rights. And the Supreme Court of Canada agreed that the Charter has extraterritorial effects. So what do we see in this legislation, or in Bill C-44, what we see is the attempt to ensure that there is judicial warrant for thesis whenever they go overseas. That, I mean, it's a direct response to the decision of our Supreme Court. This isn't something new. It's something that they have, they've been thinking about and working on for 
for a long time. I want to go even further back. I want you, I don't know if you remember this far back, some students probably won't, but you remember Abu Dhabi Abdul Razik, the Canadian citizen who went to visit his mother in the Sudan. He was arrested by the Sudanese. And he couldn't believe what was happening to him because they were asking him about questions. They were asking him questions about his connections in Canada and his behavior in Canada. He was, he claimed, tortured by the Sudanese, and then Caesar arrived again. And Caesar said to him, according to Abdul Razik, that uh, Sudan would be his Guantanamo. He would never see Canada again. He is a Canadian citizen. He was released by the Sudanese because they had no evidence against it. He, he was in fear of his life, so he went to the Canadian embassy. And at this stage, through American pressure, or we assume it's through American pressure, his name appeared on a no-fly list in the United Nations. And the Canadian government said, we cannot send you home, and refused to issue him a passport. He eventually managed to get over the, uh, over the passport hurdle, and then they said, we will grant you a paper, we'll grant you a passport if you get a plane ticket. And this man was indigent at this stage. He was begging at the embassy. They knew he wouldn't be able to get there. And the government also announced that because he is on a no-fly list, it would be a crime for anybody to give him money, to give a terrorist money, in order to get him back home. 115 Canadians donated money, including Warren Alma, they just said, well, what you just told the general? I think you just told the general. 115 people gave him money so he could get home. He took a case to, the, 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 he had to take a case to the federal court. 107 pages Justice this told the Canadian government they were abusing protest. There is now a $3 million lawsuit by Abdul Rajiv, who's now back in Canada, I guess Lord of Tannen, the, the, uh, foreign, the, 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 the Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, at the time, and a $24 million suit against, uh, against the government. There was no evidence that that, that was used. He was, uh, he was uh, uh, being prevented from, uh, from coming back to, to the government. What is the no-fly list about? The no-fly list is not about teenagers leaving Canada to get to Syria. The no-fly list is to prevent Canadian citizens from coming back to Canada. Why do we not want them to come back to Canada? Because under the other aspect of Bill C-44, we want to take away their citizenship when they're outside the country, and we want to do it when you don't have access to, to, uh, to legal advice and to the full amount of, of procedural protection they would have in Canada, and how do we know that that's what they're thinking about? Because the British are already doing that. They are already stripping people from their citizenship when they are overseas so they cannot actually come back, uh, come back to the country. That's what the no-fly list is about if you see this as being, uh, as being a response to um, as being a response to what the court has done. My, my uh, fourth example is relates to, again, quite an early case. Uh, Hassan al-Amri actually is, was one of the uh, uh, individuals who originally challenged with Adil Sharkawi our security certificate uh, regime. And uh, Al-Murray uh, won, Sharkawi and al won in the Supreme Court of Canada, the government was told, rechange the process. What we are doing is we're removing people from the country, we are doing so on the basis of secret information. And basically, Chief Justice McLaughlin said to the government, the same rules that apply to King John in the 13th century apply to you today. You are not immune from the same rules that, we, that uh, the common law applies. You have to give people a hearing before you detain them and before you actually throw them out of the, of the country to possible court. So the argument from the court was that at this stage, um, uh, you have to change things. The, the government did change things. Omri had his security certificate 
quashed uh, again by the court. And at that stage, he began to apply for permanent residence, or he, 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 he continued to apply for permanent residence. And last year, the federal court turned to the government and just said, stop hunting this man. We are not going to allow you anymore to hold him in his visible. You've been doing it for 12 years, and you have nothing. Now, here's the, here's the key. It's the, it's the security certificate rule that Bill C-51 is trying to change. And they are trying to change it in a way that looks absolutely benign. You remember my reference to defining the obligation. Let me identify to you the key provision that I think explains what the government is trying to do here. Section 77 of the current Immigration Act says this. Very, very simple. The minister shall file with the court the information and other evidence on which the certificate is based. You read that, you think, okay, the minister is required to, if they're trying to remove somebody through a certificate, they have to prove that the certificate is reasonable, they, are, they have to prove, produce the evidence of which is based. Very, very straightforward. The new act says, the minister shall file with the court the information and other evidence that is relevant to the ground of inadmissibility stated in the service. Mm -hmm. Say what, indeed. <laughs> it's like the first one says that, that they have to provide the evidence on which the certificate is based. The second one says they have to provide evidence that is relevant to the ground of inadmissibility. It looks like it's saying the same thing. It's not. The first present system is a system that says you have to produce evidence, but you also have to produce evidence about the credibility of the source and how you got that evidence. What the government is saying is we're going to introduce the evidence on which it's based, and here's the kicker, but we don't want to actually have to tell you that we gained this evidence through torture. That's what the act is about. Paranoid, you think. The man's an idiot. He's paranoid. <laughs> Let me go to CBC website, 2012. Headline, CFIS may use intelligence derived from torture, Hayes said. Public Safety Minister Vic Hayes, now a judge, Public Safety Minister Vic Tate quietly told CSPSIS, the government now expects the spy service to make the protection of life and property its overriding priority and may, under exceptional circumstances, share information based on intelligence that may have been derived from the use of torture. We have a sinister bill here. We have a bill that aims to make decisions based upon evidence that could have been taken by torture. We have a bill that can be used, as it has been used in Britain, to strip people of their citizenship and make sure that they can't get here. We have a bill that tries to counteract the application of the charter overseas by getting prior judicial warrants. And we have a bill that does a whole lot of other things that Elizabeth will tell you about. This is a nasty, 